Okay, so welcome to this third video on AMPA receptors. In this video, what we're going to do is uh, discuss the auxiliary subunit for AMPA receptors, which is known as the... well, there's many auxiliary subunits, but one we're going to study is the stargazing um, auxiliary subunit. And then we're going to uh, look at a few little drugs which interact with AMPA receptors. Okay, uh, so uh, the stargazing subunit then. So we've discussed how uh, the main uh, structure of the actual pore forming unit of uh, the AMPA receptor is that you have uh, four of these subunits coming together and forming a tetramer. And there are four possibilities for the subunits that uh, you're going to use in this position. Um, uh, sorry, there's four possibilities, um, you know, there's four options for each one of these subunits, basically. Uh, there's four genes coding for these subunits. Uh, there's the GLUA1 uh, through GLUA4 uh, subunits. But we've discussed how you can get variation in these subunits through the flip-flop mechanism and also uh, this mechanism involving glutamine to arginine at position 586 in GLUA2 is another example of how you can uh, get increased variability. We also know that when you form these tetramers, you can form homotetramers, uh, where you just use a single one of these subunits in all four sockets, or you can form heterotetramers, where you uh, pick two of them that you're going to use and put them, uh, and for each one of those, you pick, you make two of the proteins and then put them in the diagonally opposite positions, and uh, and uh, then make a heterotetramer in that way. Right, so um, now what we're going to discuss is an auxiliary subunit to uh, this whole channel. And basically, it's the subunit known as stargazing. Now, stargazing is a protein, which the membrane-spanning topology of which looks like so. So you have a single membrane-spanning domain initially. That goes around in a great big loop and then forms the second membrane-spanning domain. And then the third membrane-spanning domain and fourth membrane-spanning domain are much closer together. And the loop between the third membrane-spanning domain and fourth membrane-spanning domain is much smaller than the loop between the first membrane-spanning domain and the fourth, uh, second membrane-spanning domain. So this protein here is stargazing. And basically, what stargazing is important in doing is it binds and associates with the main uh, structure of your, um, of your AMPA receptor here. And it's involved in targeting these AMPA receptors to the, um, to the postsynaptic membrane of neurons. So, for instance, if I uh, draw a neuron here, so here's a neuron. So you have the cell body of a neuron at the centre here, and then you have these dendrite processes coming off like so. And then finally you have the axon here, this thin axon, and then the axon terminal right at the end. So basically, you want these AMPA receptors targeted to the dendrites. You want them in your, uh, pre you want them in your postsynaptic membrane because you have got some other neurons synapsing onto you here. Let's say this is its axon terminal synapsing onto you. And that neuron is going to be releasing glutamate from its axon terminal. And you need to have a, have a response to that glutamate. So you want your AMPA receptors to be positioned here, basically. And stargazing is believed to be involved in targeting these AMPA receptors to the correct place. However, it seems to have roles beyond just uh, targeting, to them, uh, targeting them to the right place. It also seems to affect the actual affinity with which certain drugs bind to these AMPA receptors, and then the efficacy of drugs once they actually have bound to the receptors. Specifically, kinate's effect on AMPA receptors. So if you remember, kinate uh, is a drug which binds to both kinate glutamatergic receptors and also AMPA glutamatergic receptors, and is an agonist, basically, causes them to open and allow current to move. Basically, the effect of kinate is hugely potentiated by the presence of stargazing, so it seems to have more effect on these, um, this main pore-forming unit of the AMPA receptor than just targeting it to the dendrites. Okay, so that's really all I have to say about stargazing. Now let's discuss some pharmacology of AMPA receptors. So, uh, the main agonist for, um, oh, actually, before we do that, let's actually talk about, you know, 
glutamate interacting with these receptors? Where does it bind? What does it do to them, basically? Okay, so uh, glutamate uh, binds on the extracellular domain, uh, clearly, because it's on the extracellular aspect of the cell rather than on the intracellular aspect. So glutamate, basically, four glutamate molecules have to bind to each one of the subunits in order to uh, get them to open. So if I just quickly remind you of the, uh, of the membrane spanning topology of each one of these subunits, then it looks pretty much like this. You have a first membrane spanning subunit, then an M2 unit, which doesn't quite get through the membrane, and then finally something that looks like this. So this is the structure of your um, each one of these subunits here. And basically, this N-terminus portion and this initial portion of the M3, M4 loop uh, come together to form what's known as the ligand binding domain. I should have done that in colour rather than black. Uh, this thing here is the ligand binding domain, basically. So those two portions of the polypeptide bind together and form a really important part, which is known as the ligand binding domain. Okay, so what happens is that each one of these subunits has one of these ligand binding domains. So I'll put it in orange at the top. So these are all ligand binding domains. So basically, to open this channel, what has to happen is that glutamate has to come and bind to each one of these, um, each one of these that can bind into mates. And obviously, a single glutamate molecule cannot bind to all of them. So actually, what you need is four glutamate molecules to come in and bind. So here's a glutamate molecule. Here's a glu another glutamate molecule here. Another glutamate molecule here. And another glutamate molecule here. So, when uh, glutamate binds, what happens is that the channel temporarily opens, okay? And uh, then it will allow uh, monovalent cations, but also a tiny bit of divalent cations, such as calcium, to move through it. And there's no directionality filter. You can go either way. Okay, so, if we look at what the overall current going uh, from the intracellular to the extracellular side is um, at each electrical potential. So we'll plot current versus voltage across the cell membrane. So by voltage, this is rather confusing because when people usually say current and voltage, they're actually talking about kind of opposite things. When they talk about voltage, they are talking about the electrical potential difference from extracellular to intracellular. So you could put from extracellular to intracellular. When people talk about the current across the membrane, they are talking about from intracellular to extracellular. Don't ask me why. I don't know what. I can't fathom it myself. Um, but voltage from extracellular to intracellular, what does that mean? That means get a little man to stand in the extracellular compartment and measure the electrical potential at that point. Now, you can't actually measure electrical potential as far as I know, uh, but uh, we can have a... Imagine that you could. In the theory of electromagnetism, you could, in principle, measure what the actual electrical potential is at an individual point. So imagine that you can actually find the number which corresponds to the electrical potential at that point. Then he moves inside the cell and measures the electrical potential inside the cell. And he's going to ask, how much has it changed from when I move from the extracellular to the intracellular aspect? And basically, that's what is meant by the voltage across the membrane. Now, usually, the resting membrane potential is minus 65 millivolts. That means that when the little man moves from here to here, the number that his little machine shows is 65 millivolts less than the number it showed out here, basically. So it went down by 65 millivolts. Therefore, the electrical potential difference from extracellular to intracellular, or the voltage from extracellular to intracellular, is negative 65 millivolts. Okay, so uh, we're going to plot as uh, we're going to plot the current that moves through this receptor if the voltage is a certain value. So here is the voltage being zero. Here is the voltage being, let's say, negative 65, which it usually is. And here is it, let's say, being plus 65 millivolts. Okay? And it's a linear scale, so it, you know, it, th there's no silliness here. It, it just goes up in the normal way. Okay, so what does current mean? So current from intracellular to extracellular. So basically what you're asking is how much current moves 
from the intracellular to the extracellular. Current means coulombs per second. So how much charge moves from the intracellular aspect to the extracellular aspect in a second, basically. Right, so let's try and uh, see what we would expect this graph to look like, and then we'll see what it actually is. So, um, if, if the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is negative 65 millivolts, that means that the electrical potential on the intracellular aspect is lower than on the extracellular compartment. Okay, now, we now open this channel, which is permeable to positive ions. Positive ions have a positive charge. They are going to want to come into an area where you have a lower uh, electrical potential, which at the moment is the intracellular compartment. So you would expect positive charge to move from this side to this side, i.e. you would expect to get a net movement of positive charge this way. So you would expect the current to be in this direction. But we aren't measuring current in that direction. We are measuring current from intracellular to extracellular. So we are moving positive charge from extracellular to intracellular. So that corresponds to a negative current from intracellular to extracellular. So we would expect the current to be negative, some, some sort of negative value when we have minus 65. Okay, now, if you make the electrical potential gradually less negative, so let's say we take it up to negative 20 or something, then you would expect the driving force for positive charge coming into the cell to be lower now, because um, how much lower the intracellular compartment is than the extracellular compartment is decreased. So the driving force of positive charge into the intracellular compartment is lower, so you would expect the movement of positive charge from extracellular to intracellular to now be less than it was at minus 65. So, if we're going to plot current from intracellular to extracellular, we would still expect that it's going to be negative, because you're actually moving positive charge in the opposite direction, but we wouldn't expect it to be as negative as it was at negative 65. So, you'd expect it maybe to be something like that. Now, let's say if we went up to plus 65 millivolts, what would we expect it to be? Well, that now means that this little man comes into the intracellular compartment and finds that the electrical potential on the intracellular aspect is plus 65 millivolts, i.e. it's 65 millivolts higher than it was on the extracellular compartment. Now that's going to drive positive charge out because it's going to now want to be on the extracellular side because uh, the extracellular side is actually lower in electrical potential than the intracellular side. Okay. So, we would finally expect positive charge to be moving in this direction. So, we would expect to see a current actually from intracellular to extracellular. So, we'd expect to see a positive current at those sort of electrical potentials. And in fact, what you actually see is you do see a straight line going through the origin like so. That's what you see if you do this experiment. So, that fits our intuition quite nicely. Okay, and I'll call it there for this video and we'll continue our discussion in the next video.